describe her. She wanted to go in her. She's been she's been laying up here for like an hour napping. Oh, uh, and then suddenly she was like, "I just want to go in my crate," and I was like, "Absolutely." Not. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, we're really we're really glad to have you. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to to do this with us. Yeah, um, and so we'll just sort of get into the intros and, and get into it. So um, welcome to the Feeling Seen uh, podcast. And we have with us today our boss, or one of our bosses, <laughs> Avery Cook, the assistant director at CAFS, and, and very happy to have Avery join us today. And Avery, much like um, parents that especially have like newborns or kids, the grandparents and other family are visiting, you must feel a little bit like that because we, of course, value you so much. But there's also an element of an excuse to really get to, to Maya and the grandchild. The real star of the show. Always the real star of the show. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, so we were so excited, Avery, that you agreed to sit down with us. And again, as Anthony said, to bring Maya in. But I think there's, you do a lot, right? You wear a lot of hats at CAPS. And I don't know if students really know that. And they may have interfaced with departments that you worked with, work with or partner with, but they may not know you. So hopefully this is a way to sort of peel back the curtain a little bit <laughs> um, and get to know you, your journey. Um, what brought you into college, college counseling, and then sort of, you know, Maya, we want to hear all about how she came into this role as well. Um, but for those of you listening, I'm Erin Scott, um, the other half of the Feeling Scene podcast anchors, a psychologist here at UNC CAPS. And as Anthony mentioned, you know, we're just so happy to bring the, you know, the illustrious, the, the hard to pin down, the, the ever busy uh, <laughs> person who keeps things running really behind the scenes at CAPS. Avery Cook. So Avery, would you share a little bit with our listeners just about you, who you are, and yeah, how you walk us through your journey of how you came to sort of be who you are here at CAPS? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm a little nervous, but it's fine. Um, uh, yeah, how far back do you want me to go? Childhood? <laughs> as, ther um, as therapist, yes, but yeah. <laughs> but okay. whatever, wherever you would like to start. Yeah. With, with so, um, so I um, after I finished up undergrad, I actually taught um, at a boarding school mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time, and wanted to take that time to sort of figure out what my next steps were going to be. Um, I really enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed coaching. I'd always done sports, um, but I also really enjoyed just sort of talking with people and talking with people that were struggling. And so um, I wanted to sort of feel out all of those things and see what resonated the most with me. Um, and working at a boarding school is a really intense process. Um, but I got to do all of those things. Um, and at the end of it, realized that sort of my time engaging with the students and talking with them about their lives and their struggles was what I really enjoyed most. Um, and my first step out of that was, was a bit of a different one. So my first step actually was to go to divinity school. Um, and that's where I started. I thought I wanted to be a youth pastor and do some um, pastoral counseling um, and got into the program and um, enjoyed parts of it, but also realized that it wasn't really fully filling what I was looking to do. Um, and so migrated over to social work. Um, I liked the counseling aspect, but I also liked the social justice aspect of it um, and just loved the program. Um, and while I was there, I had an opportunity to do an internship um, at the LGBTQ Center um, here uh, at UNC um, and got to work with students um, and got to work with that population and just loved it. So after graduation, um, I worked in community mental health for a while with adolescents and families and loved that, loved that experience. Um, but the second I had an opportunity to come to college mental health and work at UNC CAPS, I jumped at it. Um, and I've been here ever since. So um, I've been very lucky. I've been here, oh gosh, uh, 13 years now, which feels like a long time. Um, and have been lucky to been, be able to do a lot of different things. So um, I've gotten to do all the individual therapy stuff, did some groups back in the day, 
Um, and after a few years here, I got to move into a little bit more administrative stuff. Um, and so now I get to wear two hats. So I still get to do some clinical work, um, but then I get to be involved in, in a lot of these other things. Um, so with NCAPS, I like to say I run air traffic control. Um, so help with the flow of traffic and students coming in and being seen, making sure that, um, that all of the clinicians here feel supported and um, have backup when they need it and that students are able to sort of get their needs met um, the best that we all can do. Um, and then I get to be involved in places across campus. Mm -hmm. So let's see, um, I'm involved on the care team, which is a multi office group of um, folks around campus, Dean of Students, academic advising, um, accessibility and resource services, housing, all of these folks that sort of, um, we try to identify students that might be struggling um, and try and sort of, uh, as they refer to it, wrap them in a, in a circle of care um, so that we can help support students so that they um, don't have their, um, either their academic career or just sort of where they are personally kind of negatively affected by whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with them. I work with um, academic advising on the appeals committee. Um, I work with, who else? Um, around here uh, at Campus Health, I'm on the, um, on the committee to help uh, trans-identified uh, students get care here. Um, there are probably some other things, but I can't think of them. Lots of meetings, fun meetings. <laughs> When you do it, you forget what you do. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh, so many questions. Just to, wanting to <laughs> wanting to follow up on. Really, I find myself very, very excited. I'm I'm curious about. You mentioned sort of your interest around sports. What did you play, and what did oh. that mean in your life? Yeah. So all through growing up, um, I played uh, tennis, basketball, and soccer. Um, and at different times in my life, loved all of them. Uh, one of them was my favorite, depending on sort of where I was in life. But um, for me, growing up and being active um, was really important. I loved being a part of a team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's part of why I love being uh, at CAP so much, is that I love being part of a team, um, not being out there on my own. Um, and, you know, the sort of being active and physical is something that, that has stayed with me. I love being outside. I love um, uh, being physical and playing games and playing sports and um, hiking and sort of all that stuff. Um, yeah, and then uh, after graduation, got to coach and that was sort of blending sports with teaching and um, getting to run around and uh, was living, the, the school I worked at was up in Baltimore, so we were playing soccer in the snow, and it was, wow. <laughs> it was fun. It was cool. But it was fun. <laughs> That's when you know you love it, though, when you just, my dad will tell stories of going out and playing basketball in the snow, growing yeah. up in New York, and that's when you yep. know you, you love it when you're, right. when you're up. <laughs> <laughs> the rule was practice was over when I couldn't feel my feet. <laughs> a good rule to have, a good yep. rule to have. Now, Avery, students might have seen you and Maya walking, you know, back in the days when students were on campus, but walking around campus, that's something that I know you love to do and Maya loves to get out. So let's not bury the lead here. Tell us a little bit about our therapy dog and how Maya came into this world of, of therapy. Yeah. So Maya is our therapy dog for anyone that's watching this. She's the fuzzy little thing behind me. Uh, if you're listening to this, you can go on our website and she's got some glamour shots up there. Uh, Maya is really cute. Um, so I, uh, in, in my first job out of uh, school, the one of the therapists that I worked with had a therapy dog that she used in group. Um, and the dog was just amazing. And learning about what the dog could do and how it impacted the clients and impacted group, I was really struck by that. And always thought that would be something that would be fantastic to add to practice. But it's not something you can just sort of do because it's really <laughs> up to the dog, right? Like the dog's the ones who are doing all the work. Um, 
And let's see, about five years ago now, I adopted Maya. And I got Maya from a rescue group. Um, she was rescued from a high kill shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and they took her in. She was she had a terrible case of mange. She looked like a grumpy old man. She was missing a lot of her fur and um, yeah, she was real sad. Um, but they did a great job of getting her some really wonderful care. And and then when I adopted her, we got to continue to do a lot of a lot of medicated baths. Um, but then she became this like really wonderful dog. And what I learned about her um, is that she was she had a pretty calm demeanor. Um, that there was very little that sort of would rattle her, right? Being in new environments didn't scare her, being around different things didn't scare her, and she just loved people. Um, and and was it really seemed like was picking up on, on different energies from folks and would react differently to different people. And so I thought, well, let's try it. Let's see if we can, if we can help her become a therapy dog. So we did a lot of training, um, to help her sort of be able to follow commands and be able to be in an office and not sort of running around like a crazy dog. Um, and then luckily when I presented the idea to our director, he was like, that sounds great, let's do it. Um, and so my, my dream came true, to bring, bring a dog to work. <laughs> Yeah, you, thank you so much for mentioning that, because you're right, Maya does have the ability, and I hadn't thought about that, to sort of sit calmly and not be chasing after, you know, novel things that walk down the hall, and I bet that did take a lot of, a lot of training. Um, is, are students able to walk up to Maya if they see her and pet her? So I know there's certain animals that have different roles that you can't do that. What's, what's the deal with Maya and, like, petting her and so, so when Maya is on duty, she has a vest on that marks her as a therapy dog and says, you know, she's got a great patch that says free hugs and kisses. Um, and so, yes, Maya is here to be interacted with. Um, she's always on a leash, so no one has to worry about her sort of coming up uninvited um, or getting into their space. If you have any sort of worries or concerns about dogs, that's not going to be an issue. But for anyone that wants to and you see her either sitting in my doorway or as we're walking around, it's always great to stop and pet her. It's, it's really the best part of her day. Um, so she will happily take some scratches behind the ear. She's a real sucker for a belly rub. Um, but part of the reason why she's here, in addition to sort of things that she actually does in therapy, is she's just kind of a nice welcoming presence to have in the building. You know, I think sometimes coming into either a medical building or a therapy building, it can feel a little nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a cute dog helps things feel a little bit less um, uh, sterile, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's here for a quick sort of pat behind the ears, or sometimes folks will just come and sit on the ground with her right outside of my office and, and you know, give her a real good um, set of scratches, which makes her blissfully happy. She's yeah. here for all of it. <laughs> One of the other losses of, of COVID with students not coming in to, to CAPS directly right now as we're doing kind of phone contact and other telehealth things is not getting to see Maya as much, but at least some CAPS staff when they're in can, can still kind of interact with, with Maya. But I imagine Maya is also missing the, the students. I know I've seen a lot of joy in, in the hallway of students just passing by. And like you just said, the welcoming of getting ready to walk up kind of to the front desk and before they get there, get into your office and they just play with Maya and you can just see the settling and you can just see the, the joy that, that happens. And so that's one of the, the misses right now of, of COVID. And so people will just have to um, enjoy this glimpse at, at, at Maya um, on, on the podcast. And as well, as you said, enjoy the, the model spread online. <laughs> right, exactly. She has, she's a lot of glamour shots. She has an Instagram page that, that the human who runs that has been a little slack on. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that could be my 2021 20, New Year's resolution oh, yeah. uh, is, is to get Maya's Instagram back running. But yeah, she does. She misses the students terribly. Um, 
and you know as sometimes as we're walking downstairs we'll run into some students checking into campus health um, and she'll get a couple little belly rubs um, and she does love seeing staff and um, you know I think in this sort of COVID safe socially distant sort of world it's nice to have a, a being in the building that that doesn't have to be six feet apart they <laughs> right. sort of come up and greet us all I think it's nice a proxy <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We'll we'll come back to Maya, but we certainly don't want to forget you. Um, the reason you're you're here today is, you know, we we just really again want to kind of like I say, peel back the veil because I think there are so many things that you do and hats that you wear at Caps. And I wanted to was curious if you you don't do as much therapy. You do have a clinical load, but when you were seeing students, what were some of your you know? interest and in, and in what kind of students did you really really get kind of excited about we know you work with all students but okay what's your what's your, your clinical like yes so um so depression and anxiety are things that i really love working with um and those were always i think my big two as i think is is a lot of what we see around here um but i also love working with students that are working on identity issues, thinking through um, who they are as individuals. One of the things that I think is so great um, about being in your late teens or early 20s is you're really sort of uh, getting to sit down and think about who you are and who you want to be. Um, and I love that exploration. Um, and I love, um, uh, I, I really love working with students who identify as queer, um, particularly folks that, um, are exploring where they are on the gender spectrum, um, folks that identify as trans um, and non-binary and, and folks that are really uh, learning about and embracing sort of that part of their identity. I think that can be um, such a wonderful time. It can be such a gift to be able to, to bear witness to that or help somebody on that journey. So um, yeah, I think those were probably some of my favorite things. Yeah, as you talk about that, that work with um, queer populations kind of broadly defined, I'm curious, I'm thinking about your, your experience you just shared with us about divinity school, and I'm just wondering where you noticed that, that come into play, perhaps in, in those discussions and how you might use that background um, to better help uh, the students that you see, because I know that that has come up a lot in my work with people who have identified along the spectrum of LGBTQ kind of in that thing. And so I'm just curious about for your experience, given that divinity background. Ooh, all right. <laughs> yeah, we're going there. Okay. We asked the hard hitting um, questions here, I feel like here it. <laughs> So, so I actually think, so I really appreciate that question. I think that is such a powerful topic um, for a lot of queer folks. Um, uh, it was certainly, as I went to divinity school, it was something that was very present for me. Um, I come from a faith background um, that won't, um, uh, that doesn't have queer folks in leadership. So, so I, I knew going into divinity school that as a queer person, I wouldn't be able to be ordained in my faith background. Um, and had to sort of think through what that meant for me and continue to sort of explore what that means for me. Um, I think there is a perception out there that, um, that uh, having a queer identity and a spiritual identity are separate things or things that can't coexist. And that's just 100% not true. There, um, there are affirming um, congregations everywhere. And so whatever your faith background is there, is, there are folks out there that are affirming and support you in that, um, in both of those identities. Mm -hmm. um, I've, mm, I'm trying not to get too uh, preachy here. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, at one point I wanted to, you know, right. get, get <laughs> sermon, so it's always in there. It's in there. <laughs> um, but I, you know, um, I personally have, have done a lot of sort of thinking and exploring about that. And um, I think that helps me sort of um, encourage others to really think through what these two identities mean for them. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many 
gifts that come with being queer and getting the opportunity to think through these more complicated aspects of identity. Um, that I think that goes along with the idea of spirituality and how spirituality calls us to really deeply think through things and connect with who we are um, both as beings and collectively. Um, and it would be disingenuous to not talk about all of the hurt that can also come along with these two things. There's a lot of hurt that comes from different spiritual backgrounds at times um, related to queerness. And I think sometimes there can be some trauma in there. And I think that's important to sort of sort through and think through and come to a place of healing when possible. Um, but I think lots of queer folks want um, to to also own their spiritual identity. And I think there's so many ways to do that. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Oh, that was, that was amazing. And I'm glad you, I'm especially glad you spoke to letting people know that those are identities that can coexist and can be, because that's one of the things I've encountered. One of my great sadnesses is seeing people think that I have to let this part of me go in order to maybe especially um, kind of embrace mm -hmm. my queer identity and say, I love this about me and I love myself and I don't have to tear myself down and thinking that that means I have to let this other really important part of me go. And that has real, that does real damage and yeah. has real um, negative implications. And so I really just appreciate you giving that, that message of hope that that, that definitely isn't the case that that can coexist it takes work and yep. as you acknowledge there are places that are not safe and so you have to look for those specific places but it is it is possible yeah yeah that's right those places are out there they're always out there and and particularly in the wonderful world of the internet you can find so many people um, so many people and places that will affirm both aspects of your identity. Um, and yeah, Anthony, I really appreciate what you said about, you know, folks feeling like they have to give up their spirituality. And I, I think the flip is also true. The folks that feel they have to give up some aspect of their queerness in order to stay connected with their spirituality um, and to think about, to allow folks to sort of explore what it means to them to hold both the, the queer side of them and the spiritual side of them um, and to, yeah, to let them live together. Yeah, I definitely felt like I was in charge. I mean, it was a, it was a message of hope. And I think that it is part of you, Avery. I didn't know that about you till today. But, but there is that message of hope, right? And we certainly seeing students, this is, this is not a, you know, unique, it's unique, but it's a narrative that we see where students are really, you know, hurt and struggling. And so for anyone out there listening, you know, we're going to transition into how you can connect with CATS, but what we hope you hear is that, you know, we hear, we hear you, we affirm you, we validate your experience, and we can help you unpack some of those uh, messages that you might have received and find your community, right? Find your place, find those spaces. Um, and you're right, when we grew up, you know, the internet, well, I'm not going to date myself that much, but the internet was in its infancy, so it was a little bit harder. And now there's just, there's a plethora of resources and we're happy to help you connect. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. I feel like, yeah, like, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but as you mentioned, con connection to, to CAPS, Erin, that just makes me think, I mean, you, you all know, eventually I find a way to work group into the conversation. <laughs> so um, just want to, as we're in this part, specifically to the conversation we're having, specifically highlight two groups that we offer are in out and in between uh sexuality and gender spectrum group that mm -hmm. that we're offering at caps and then also our intersections yes. uh group for uh bipoc queer identified yes. students and so wanted to just mention that so specifically as we're having the conversation we're having currently wanted to especially mention those those two groups as well as the host of other CAP services, which includes our many groups, which includes the individual therapy we provide and other services. So all of those are also welcoming and open, but I was thinking of specifically those groups as we were um, discussing what we're talking about right now. Yeah, both those groups are so wonderful. I'm thrilled that we're offering them. Yeah, I think it's really great. 
Yeah. So Avery, sometimes we get students that are worried about their friend or, mm -hmm. or partner. Um, and so in your role, we, one thing we know about you that our listeners may not know is you actually kind of like trauma and, and not trauma. Let me not say that. You kind of like crises. I'm a crisis right? junkie. You kind of yeah, like when things are kind of popping and hopping. And, and so how do you stay grounded? It's a two-part question. How do you stay okay. grounded when things around you are bubbling and decisions have to be made kind of on the fly? And I know for me, that can be very anxiety provoking and I can act a little quickly, but you seem really grounded when those moments happen. Um, so that's the first part of my question. And then I'm curious if you have ways that you would encourage, of course, we'll, we'll do a, excuse me, a segment where we talk about how to access CAP services. Mm -hmm. Are there ways that folks can, if they're concerned or worried, that you would maybe general tips you would give folks um, to help a friend kind of in distress. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to hold on to both parts. Okay. <laughs> so I appreciate you saying that I look really calm. I think sometimes I'm like a duck. So I, I look really calm on the surface and underneath I'm paddling um, really fast. So yes, I, I do own that. Um, I love, crisis work a lot. If, if things are on fire, I would really love to be running in with the fire extinguisher um, or sometimes just running in. Um, but, uh, I, but I think what I enjoy, I certainly don't enjoy that folks are in distress at all, but, um, but I like having the opportunity to be helpful when things feel um, that they're sort of melting down or a little bit out of control. I feel like no matter how bad things seem, mm -hmm. there's always something that we can do to make it just even just one notch better. And sometimes one notch better is, is the first step, right? There's, there's not going to be anything we do in the moment that's going to completely 100% solve a situation and have everyone feeling magical. Right, it would be great if we had that. Um, but I keep trying to develop a magic wand; it'd be wonderful. Um, but but sometimes when things feel most dire, we can figure out what that first step is, mm -hmm. and that first step might get you out of the mud. Mm -hmm. That then sort of helps you climb up the ladder to to being able to to feel great. Um, and I think what's so lovely about being here is everyone who works here is so caring and compassionate and wants to help everyone get out of, of that place where they're stuck. And so even when it's a crisis, it's a time when we're all working together to help that person move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm just kind of a, a, a cog in that. Um, and I love, it. it's, my, it's my favorite thing. Um, but yeah, but I, I think um, being able to help when things feel dire just is, is lovely. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to have. So I think, I think that's what I enjoy about it. It's also a little bit of adrenaline rush and I like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it's, you know, there, there are a lot of toes, right? Right. It, it, and it does. It keeps, it keeps me on my toes and keeps things around here. There, things around here are never boring, right? <laughs> never, never a boring day around here. Um, yeah, so, and, and in terms of the second part of your question, in terms of um, what, to, what to do if, if you have a friend or a loved one that you're worried about. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I think the number one thing that we can do is, that, that we all can do, is to sit and talk really specifically with someone about what we're noticing and what we're worrying about in a really open and non-judgmental way. Right. I think lots of times when any of us are struggling, we feel like we're hiding it really well. We're almost never hiding it really well, but we feel like we are. <laughs> okay. Right. And so to have someone notice mm -hmm. and come at it from a place of caring um, and a place of non-judgment can sometimes be exactly what's needed to sort of not only open the door for that person that's struggling, but give them permission to make that first contact, right? What, what we know here at CAPS, and this is true with counseling centers across the country, we're not unique, is that when a student's struggling, the counseling center is almost never the first stop, right? Mm -hmm. The first stop is usually a friend, a roommate, a professor, an advisor, a parent, a sibling. 
it's somebody that you're close to. Because when any of us are hurting, we're going to go to someone we know probably before we go to a stranger, right? Even if we know the stranger might be the person that can help the most, the most comfortable first stop is going to be that, that person that we're close to. And so if there's somebody that you're close to in your life that's struggling, it's not that you have to fix it. Like, absolutely not. But you can be that first step to say, you know, I've been a little worried about you. You've seemed more down recently. Or I've noticed that you've been a little bit more tearful sometimes. Um, you know, the other day when we were talking, I know you weren't mad at me, but you seemed a little irritable and kind of snapped at me. And I just wondered if you were hurting in some way. Mm. right to to really specifically point out things that you're noticing and do it in a really open way and from there you sort of can start a really lovely dialogue and that may be how you then connect someone to sort of the next thing that's helpful but what you're doing then is you are being a partner that's going along for a ride mm. and I think for any of us when we're hurting um and doing something that might feel really scary, having someone beside us, either um, either in actuality or in uh, you know in a virtual way, mm -hmm. um, can be what helps that to happen. Wow, that was you know I, replay this part if you're, if you're <laughs> worried about someone. That was that was just it was very well stated and warm, and, and I think the values that we have as cats certainly show through. Um, and I agree 100% that, you know, I hadn't thought about it until you said it, but we don't often go to the professionals first. We're going to go to someone familiar. So you play an important role if you're listening to this to, in someone in your circle's life. And so by just seeing them, validating them, we call this feeling seen because we think it's so important to feel seen and heard. Um, and so replay this back for a second. <laughs> there were some nuggets of gold in there that you got you to gotta catch. <laughs> Aaron's a hype person, if you didn't realize, Avery. Love it. In fact, I'm recording Aaron doing this, and I'm going to replay it. I'm just going to put it on my phone and just have it as a button that I can hit multiple times a day. So if you see me with my headphones on, I've got Aaron hyping me. In the got back. me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I'm not sure, Aaron, if there were other questions you might have or things you were hoping we would talk with Avery about or Avery if there were other things you were hoping to share about just things about your passions or if there are things as we're in this um, very difficult time of COVID as well as things happening with with our government and unrest um, if there were any other things you wanted to say because we're moving towards as as the podcast ends we have a section of our podcast that we'll we'll introduce to you that our fans are are probably wondering what happened last time when we didn't when we didn't cover it but we'll get to our just stop it segment in a moment but i did want to check in um with both of you to see if there was anything else that you were hoping to that we would touch on today oh yeah i'm not letting avery go that quick i got some more questions you know one of the reasons Anthony and I started this is because in the pandemic, we were finding, you know, just missing being able to kind of connect and, and pop in each other's offices and kind of check in. Um, but it sort of merged into how are we coping? How are you doing? And I'm curious how this pandemic has been and what are some things that you've done to kind of make it through? Um, you know, I can talk about, I, I have shared like projects around the house and baking things, but what's been some of the things that have helped you survive this, this pandemic? Yeah, it has been, it's been a super challenging time. Um, I think it's invited, I think it's invited us to get more creative with ways that we connect with folks. Um, so I went from one of the things that I have in my life is a, is a really close group of friends that we meet every week on Sunday at a coffee shop. Um, and it's a huge group of us and um, it's been going on for years and years. Well, we can no longer meet in a coffee shop. And so now we have Sunday Zooms, right? Where we all get together, not around the, the table in the coffee shop, but around the Zoom. Right. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's taken a little bit of creativity and a little bit of allowing for you know, while there's part of me that sort of early on Sunday morning is like, I can't do another Zoom. I, I Zoom all day at work. Mm -hmm. And then, I, but I know 
that if I can actually get on there, I'm going to get to connect with these people. Even if it's not in the most ideal way, it's going to be in a way that really sort of feeds me. Um, and yeah, I think I've gotten creative with, um, with, with different hobbies. Um, I have decided, um, I love being outside. So if anyone invites me to do anything outside, I just automatically say yes. <laughs> so I've been doing tons of hikes. Um, we moved this year and discovered some secret trails that are behind our house. Um, so I feel like I've got my own secret hiking trail. Um, it's a little muddy, um, but Maya doesn't mind. And we <laughs> sort of go, um, we're trekking back there together and then I'll meet up with friends in different parks and trails. Um, to where we can interact, but in a way that feels super safe. Um, and I had a friend invite me to, to learn pickleball. I don't know if y'all have ever learned pickleball. It's giant, oh. it's giant ping pong. So, so you're playing on a tennis court, um, but you only play in like half the tennis court and it's super fun. You play with a wiffle ball and wooden pack, great fun. Um, so, you know, so I'm taking up new sports and if anyone advised me to do anything outside of there, let's do it. Fly kites, great, let's do it. Let's, um, you know, rake leaves, great. I'll come rake your leaves, it's fantastic. Um, and then I've, you know, baked some things and I've recently started learning to play the guitar. I'm terrible at it. Uh, I am not good at it. Maya, for the first month, she is a very open, non-judgmental dog. For the first month, she judged me very <laughs> she'd come in the room and she'd see me pick up the guitar and she would turn and <laughs> pedal right out but i've i've gotten enough now to where she'll stay in the room with me but i've but things like that baking and and playing an instrument they're things that um use my brain in a different way right i think we're not as stimulated or not as engaged as we typically are when we're running into people all the time or we're going out or we're doing things and we're kind of constantly um, engaged in a different way. So, so I've found that if I can force my brain to do something different or something that's even a little bit uncomfortable, but in a fun, challenging way, it's helped me feel a little bit more sustained. Maya's judging me now, too. She just did a dramatic rollover. <laughs> <laughs> she remembered the early days she of did. guitar. She did. Oh, oh, it was terrible. <laughs> the first key chord was awful. My hearing didn't recover for, for a week. <laughs> yeah, no, it certainly can resonate with a lot of the things you share. Not moving in a pandemic. I mean, you deserve an award just, just for that. But okay. it's certainly, you know, having to find creative ways to connect with folks and you know, trying to get outdoors early on. Anthony actually encouraged me to walk at the lunch hour or in the morning. And it really helped kind of combat that Zoom fatigue and also that wall that some of us hit early on where it was like, okay, this is nice. I can't do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I agree with like being able to get outdoors and um, yeah, just being creative. I think one of the things when I meet with students that I'm just always so impressed with is that hope, right? And like, yeah, people will acknowledge this is hard, this is different, but lots of folks are like, and, right? That sentence okay. continues with, and I'm, yeah, I'm Zooming on Sundays now, or we have game night virtually, or girls night, or whatever the thing is. And I just think that we are tapping into our potential to sort of overcome and that resilience that we have. Um, and for folks that aren't able to do that, that's okay as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's yep. this judgment if you're stuck. Um, yeah. But certainly therapy could help you know, move some of those things and help you think about creative ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that idea of sort of being stuck or being in the struggle, I think that's something that we've all also hit periodically, even if you are doing your best. I think just the amount of time that this has all been going on, I think there are definitely times where we hit a wall or get stuck. So I think the other thing this pandemic has really challenged in me is the, is the idea of self-compassion. Um, and I've had to really work that muscle, um, which sometimes can be a challenge for me, but, um, but being compassionate with myself and acknowledging that um, we can't be as productive as we were before all of this happened because we're going through a stressor that none of us have experienced before. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be days that you're more tired or days that it's just a little bit harder to do things. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to sort of make allowances for the fact that 
that that's completely valid and that we would we need to be as gentle with ourselves as we would be with a good friend that was experiencing the same struggles and and just allowing for for any of us to have a bad day and, and to have that be okay yeah yeah so well articulated, really. I, and I appreciate that very much. And I'm thinking about just how much the little things matter, um, at least to me in, in this time, like how, how connected I feel right now as we're having the conversation we're happy, having recording this, this podcast for folk and getting to know Avery in different ways and things I, I wasn't aware of before is just really, I find myself right now in this moment, very energized and, and excited about this. And so just something, this little thing of us being on the screen together, recording this podcast, having a conversation in a different way, just as I'm finding just excited and I feel very connected. And so it really is, I think those, those little moments. And um, I don't know if you're aware, Aaron, but Avery is aware that even the little moment of Avery recommended a book to me that I really, really enjoyed a book called group um, by Christy Tate. And I read that um, I devoured it in like a day, two days um, <laughs> over kind of the Christmas break part of things and couldn't wait to, and you won't probably ever hear me necessarily say this this way, but couldn't wait to get back into office <laughs> because I just wanted to talk to Avery. And so it was just really fun to stand in the doorway with my mask and her way away from me. So that was a little odd, but still kind of had a mask on and we had um, a pretty lengthy conversation about the book and reacting to it and what's shared in this memoir of this person who went through an experience of getting into group therapy and how that helped um, her heal. And, and that was just really a special um, time for me in the last couple of weeks to, to read a really, um, to read a, real, a book that I really enjoyed and then be excited to, to talk about it with, with a colleague. And so that was, that was just really a wonderful moment. So it's also the, these little moments um, in this time and tuning into that. We offer a lot of, so Avery mentioned self-compassion and that's often underneath the umbrella of mindfulness. And we offer a lot around mindfulness at CAPS. Either we have a lot of professionals at CAPS that offer that in their individual work, but then we also have a lot of mindfulness groups that we offer. And that's one of the things that I think of or take from mindfulness is that, that appreciation of the moment and what it means that the moment is really all we have at the end of the day and to, to yeah. savor that in a lot of ways and enjoy that. So it's those little things and having enough of the little things can build up and serve as resilience in a tough time. Um, so really appreciate that. So that was what was on my mind as you all were talking about that in this time of COVID. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no way I could read a book about group and not like beg to hear from the group guru about guru. it. I mean, I honestly, I was counting down, not totally counting down the days until winter break ended, but I, I was so looking forward to, I just couldn't wait to hear what you thought about it from your, like, just the amazing knowledge that you have about groups and how that just permeates your practice in so many ways. And I loved hearing um, the way that you both experienced that book and thought through it. It was, but it, it's exactly what you're talking about, right? Like these little things mm -hmm. are so magical, right? Because it's a, it's a different form of connecting, but I think the connection is almost sweeter because um because they're not automatic right mm -hmm. now right yeah. um we have to we have to work for them a little bit mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that intention i'm feeling a little jealous that i'm not in the book club but that's okay <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, you just wait i i read a lot and so i'm gonna read one and then i'm gonna come down to your office and say hey Aaron. okay okay i'm gonna hold you how to about this one <laughs> yeah. um, we are nearing the end, and, and certainly this has been great. I could we could talk forever. There's a couple more questions I have, and then I want to tell folks how they can get connected for CAP services. But one of the things I know about Avery and, and Anthony knows as well is that you do like to travel. Um, and Anthony and I have been, you know, just longing for the days when we can safely travel and of course missing the days we could and i'm curious of the travel that you've been able to do in recent years if you have a destination that just stands out to you something you know fun a site that you've taken in that you would want to share with our listeners yeah so i'm 
feeling this desire for travel. I have two full trips planned out, ready to go the <laughs> second that we can leave our house. Only two? <laughs> You're slipping. <laughs> Only <laughs> two. <laughs> Anthony, when I say fully planned out, I mean, I have full itineraries ready, ready to go. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk. I have, I have you beat. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you do. I'm sure. I, uh, look, I can only compete so much with, with the, yeah. Um, but yes, the, um, gosh, four years ago now, we were able to take a trip down to Ecuador and to the Galapagos Islands, um, which was an absolute sort of bucket list yeah. dream. It was amazing. Um, it was a really active trip. So we got to kayak down the Amazon river and stay at some eco lodges and, um, and meet um, some wonderful folks there. And then got to sort of hike in, in um, some of the lava lands of the Galapagos islands and watch the, um, watch the, the land change from sort of really lush greenery to sort of, lava rocks um mm -hmm. and got to snorkel with like sharks i mean my they, they put me down in a cave with like just like a little shark family like just hanging out and i was like hi <laughs> popped up real fast um got to see penguins and um the blue-footed booby uh birds that are down there mm -hmm. was magical um giant tortoises anyway if anyone ever gets a chance to go down there it's um the nature down there, the animals down there, the mm -hmm. land down there, the people down there, it's all fantastic. Highly recommend it. So, yeah. Yeah, we've been, thank you for sharing. I've been going to different destinations as people share their favorite places or just meaningful places they've gone to. And one of the things I really like about travel is we can get, and I won't go too far off the, the deep end, I'll watch you all's reaction, but we can get really, um, centric here in America about like our lives and the way things go and our values. But when we travel, we get happiness and, uh, and people who maybe don't have the same material things, right? Or just the neighborly, the communities that are built um, in, in other places. And I think it's a really nice way to sort of remind us, um, A, that we're not the, the end all be all. This is a great nation. I love being American. I love being, you know, um, from here, but I love to travel to to glimpse how other people live and how their values play out and how they find happiness and and those sorts of things. And so when I think about you and you know snorkeling and, and all those things, and I think you know it, it's just a wonderful experience that can really remind you and it can make you also when you come back really value what you have here as well. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's something that Anthony and I have been threading in is like asking people their destinations and favorite places and I also have trips planned all I need is to go ahead and once the vaccines are widely distributed I've already okay, we're gonna we're gonna have to sit down so I can find out about these trips that's all <laughs> planned. But by the time we're done I might have like six trips planned I might just steal the trips <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well right, yeah oh, yes go ahead Anthony no go ahead Aaron I was gonna say it's, it's been so lovely talking to you you know you've kind of, again, preached to us, uplifted us, that there was some hope. We I always just appreciate Avery's humor, you know, and way of groundedness, I think, when, again, things are going on, there's some groundedness. And I know she and I have been connected through all the things going on in, in politically right now. And so um, that's been, my love for CNN has been, <laughs> has been validated. <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward, she knows that I, I requested the inauguration day off. And you know, just to be able to have that moment and not be rushed and just to sit in that. So I'm looking forward to us continuing to, to chat about that as that. Absolutely. Um, and we might have to have you back, you know, listeners, if there are things that really resonated with you today, please let us know. We can have Avery come back and follow up on some things because this has really fed me in a, in a, in a way I feel really connected as Anthony was saying and, and hope that listeners feel that as well. Yeah, I totally agree. This has been wonderful. Y'all are so lovely. <laughs> are so lovely but, but this has been especially lovely because I, I think it's exactly what y'all said you know we we get to talk one-on-one -on -one, but sometimes it's super focused on work stuff or we get to talk in groups and it's not quite but this has been um 
just a really lovely amount of time to be spent um, talking through a different lens. I, that's a mixed metaphor, but here we are. <laughs> so if folks want to connect to CAP services, you know, definitely our website is a great way. You can also call our main line, um, which is 919-966-3658, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Um, but there's lots of very clear directions on our website, the groups that we were talking about earlier, um, which is the in out in between group and then the BIPOC um, intersection group for LGBTQ plus students, plus other groups that we have will all be accessible. You'll learn more about that on our website and you can connect if you complete that form, you'll connect with a group facilitator and you can get some information that way. Um, we just offer all, a lot of services. So if you have any questions, please, please, please reach out. But now, before we leave and wrap up, Avery, we have a section called Just Stop It. And we came up with that title in part because we realized that lots of students believe that they're the only ones that feel this way or think this way or are going through this. And we want them to just stop it. We want to remind them that there are universal things that we all go through. Um, and so with that, is there something that you would want to impart to students under this segment, segment called Just Stop It? Gosh, that's a great one. Okay, I don't have to think about it. So I'm going to have one that might be a little bit controversial, but you're going to have to hear me out. You're going to have to hear my whole explanation. Okay. Okay. So don't clip the sound bite because if you clip the sound bite, I'm going to get cracked. Okay. So so my just stop it is around our current definition of self care. Okay. Don't clip me. All right. I've got an explanation. So, so I think we rightly talk a lot about self-care, and, but I think when we talk about it, we often think about it in two different ways. We think about it as a distraction or a reward. Mm. But I really want people to think about self-care in thinking about things that rejuvenate you, things that sort of recharge your body. Your body. There are times that we absolutely need a distraction, 100%. Like there are times that, um, that we just need to take a break from the world and get a little distracted. And there are absolutely times that we deserve a reward. But I want us to all take the time to also do things that recharge our batteries, things that make us feel more able to take on the world, not feel like we've just escaped from the world for a brief period of time. And so I think that if there are times that we can really think about what is it that I can do that after I'm done, I feel better or I feel more able to take on the world, more able to take on this assignment, more able to have that challenging conversation, more able to watch the news, frankly. Um, wh what are some of those things? And, and think about self-care as, um, as we do plugging in our phones at night, right? As opposed to just trying to kind of run away from things right now. How's that? <laughs> Am I still going to get dragged for my no self-care? <laughs> Not at all. That's, that's what we have this segment for. And what, what I think Avery is encouraging us all is just stop it with this narrow idea of self-care and that it encouraging us to open that up and to, to think of it in this more nuanced way. And I think in doing that also then, it becomes easier in a certain ways for, for people also to conceptualize because it, it, it can be those narrow definitions mm -hmm. that leave us boxed in, leave us believing I don't have time and I can't do that. Right. But once you can break out of that, that box, that, that narrowness, that sort of cell, then you've given us an invitation to think more broadly. And we know with the work that we do, when we can expand kind of thought and horizon, options blossom and become apparent and we can feel much less stuck, much less trapped. And so very much appreciate you sharing that. Just stop it with, <laughs> with our listeners and viewers. Well, thank you so much, Avery, for agreeing to come on our podcast. We have loved this hour with you. Um, and yeah, hope we can get you back in the future. Well, anytime. This was wonderful. Thank you both so much. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. You are very welcome. Thank you so much again. So this has been Feeling Seen, a UNC CAPS podcast. <laughs>